Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship. Please stand as we have our call to worship on the screens. Today's reading comes from Life and Liturgy. We gather in the name of the living Christ to worship God. Surely God is in this place and calls us to worship in spirit and in truth. God's love is for you and for all people everywhere. Christ is with us. Praise the Lord. Good morning, one and all. Thank you so much for being here today, whether you're in person or online. We always want to offer you a hearty welcome. If this is your first time with us in person, we pray that you would take the opportunity and just ask you, if you would, to fill out that Connect card that's before you in the pew, drop it in the box so we can connect with you. And then after the service, we have a time for coffee and donuts time to get your sugar and caffeine, but also to have some fellowship with others just so we can get to know you and you can also get to know us. So we want to make sure that that's known. Uh, first of all, I want to make sure that you all are aware that we have Trey here with us today. He's been willing to share this gift and we're so thankful to be here to be with us. slowly integrated, not overwhelmed in the beginning, so he's going to play a couple songs for us today uh, as we are leading in worship. But today, I uh, just want to let you know for the next few Sundays, we kind of have a theme. Today, this theme is the Lord. So you're going to notice all the songs that are very common today. The theme is you'll see the word the Lord that's in there. Even with the first song that was sung, it gets back to the first part of scripture where Abraham asked God, I believe it's in, let's look, I actually have the scripture here. It's in Genesis, I believe in chapter 18, verse 3, where he says, I have I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord. Do not pass your servant by. We believe that that word Lord actually comes from kind of a sacred word in the Hebrew context of Yahweh, which means Master and Lord. So today as we sing these songs and we hear the name the Lord, don't just take it for granted. Don't just put it to the side. Don't just discard it and say, what another name? Think about God being Master and Lord over your life as we worship together today. We're going to start off today with singing. First of all, we're going to sing House of the Lord. This is Family Sunday, so we want to have some kid-friendly songs. This actually was from PBS. They had an opportunity to sing this song, and then following after that, we'll go to the Lord, I lift your name on high. The words will be on the screen, so you can also look for the second one in the hymnal. I'll tell you that number. But let's start off today with House of the Lord. We 
special kudos to Patty and Jimmy for helping out and, uh, and the kids learn about Joseph today. Well, one of the important parts uh, in our service every week is we take prayer requests. Um, I have uh, one prayer request already, and that's from uh, Joe Carroll. Joe Carroll's brother Jeff Carroll, who's 61, who's living in Portland, Oregon. Um, Harry, he, he was diagnosed with uh, skin cancer this week, is that right? Melatonin. Uh, type of, and this is the second time he's had to deal with this. Um, so just be in prayers for Jeff Carroll um, as he is uh, struggling with skin cancer again in the, the regimen uh, to help heal him uh, from that. I also want to give you a quick update. I'm updating you on the Lamb family. Uh, Jackie again and her kids were here for PBS. Uh, so they transferred then uh, Lamb to uh, Kindred Hospital in South County. So it's uh, right on the other side of uh, uh, Mercy South for St. Anthony. It's a, an acute care. I think it's a little bit longer term care situation. Um, so they are trying. He's been on a ventilator uh, for a few weeks now. And so they're trying to start weaning him off. Uh, but even as they're they're, I guess, uh, make, are changing tubes from one size to another. He's had some issues, uh, some of the switch, I think they, they left him off uh, or something like that for too long, and so that caused some complications. So we're almost back where we started um, uh, on that. So just continue to be in, in uh, prayers for the Lamb family. Again, it's one step forward, two steps back. Seems like they moved him from the hospital into this acute care, which is a blessing, which is a prayer request. Uh, but now it's trying to get them stabilized and kind of back on that path to hopefully get home is what they're hoping in the next couple months. So continue to keep Ben Lamb, uh, Jackie, and Carrie. Uh, Ben's wife's name is Carrie, and uh, Jackie's the, the daughter-in-law. So be in prayer for the Lamb family. What other prayer requests uh, are there? And if you're at home and you have a prayer request, we'd love to hear it. Just go ahead and type it in, and Eric will make sure that we, uh, we share that. Linda. Tuesday, the 3rd of October, he will be uh, gifted with a uh, pacemaker. So, okay. so keep uh, Gary Gilbert in your prayers, especially on October 3rd. Uh, he'll be having a pacemaker uh, installed. Is that what we say? Um, uh, in place. So just be prayers for that whole process. 
So will you be home on the third, or that, will they keep you overnight? It, it, it sounds like I'll be home. I guess it depends. But <laughs> these I, days, I'm I'm hoping hoping. Yeah, I, I may refuse to drive him back. <laughs> That's okay. We, we can help get Gary home. And they yeah, home yeah I'll get him right. tomorrow. But uh, but be in prayers for Gary as he goes to that procedure on October third.
those who are able to stand, to please stand. We're going to sing 734, Be Strong in the Lord. You can look at your hymnals for the words on the screens. Again, notice the word Lord there as we think about this theme. Find strength in Him. Those who are strong.
about how we take the law and then we up it and see how legalistic we can become, which isn't what Jesus is necessarily intending here. And so here, what again, Jesus, just to remind us that Jesus is calling for human flourishing and for justice. And we've seen that uh, in the Beatitudes, the first uh, few weeks as we went through the Beatitudes, anytime uh, one of the traditions that the Hebrews had whenever they came into a new land is that they would receive blessings. So that's one of the reasons why we have the Beatitudes and the blessings at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, is that they are coming into the kingdom and they are being blessed as they come into the kingdom. And then here what we are in the middle of are the antitheses, and what we see is six teachings that Jesus is giving that begins with the phrase, you have heard it said, but I tell you that. And so what we see in these antitheses is that Jesus isn't demolishing the law. He's not saying the law is old, it's, it's antiquated, I need to add to it because it's deficient in some kind. That's not what Jesus is doing. He actually brings us into the antitheses by saying, I did not come to abolish the law, which is what he's going to be accused of, which is what uh, the, the Jewish officials are going to come after him for because he thinks that he's not uh, following the law. They keep checking him, they keep following him around and stalking him, trying to trap him and break the law. And Jesus is saying, I'm not coming to abolish the law, I'm coming to fulfill it. And here he's helping to recalibrate our hearts by bringing us through these antitheses. And what are those antitheses? If you're just joining us, the first one he talked about was murder, right? So here he's giving us instructions on how to not be on dateline. So here in this idea of murder, what Jesus says, you've heard it says, you shall not murder. But I tell you, anyone who is angry at his brother commits murder in his heart. And you're like, wait, what? Because if you spend any time, as I've said before, driving on uh, Highway 40, you've become angry. Or Hampton, especially as of late. I don't know how many times that I've had to shake my fist. That's all I do is I shake my fist at people. Uh, and so, so here you become angry. And, and so here, that's the seeds of anger um, to, to lead us to, to murder. It's because that begins in our heart. And then what we see the next week is we talk about adultery. And we talk, Jesus says, you have heard it said... You shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Yikes. So here Jesus is, is establishing where the Jewish, especially men's hearts are, and if they've looked at anyone lustfully, they've already committed adultery. And why is that significant? It's significant for the next antithesis, which we talked about last week, which was about divorce. And Jesus says, you have also said, whoever divorces his wife, let, him have, let her have a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, everyone who divorces his wife, except for on the ground of sexual immorality, which is adultery, makes her commit adultery. And whoever makes a divorced woman, uh, whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So again, what I talked about last week was this issue that was happening. Uh, women were being taken advantage of in this culture. And that they were having their dowries taken from them, and that, that uh, especially uh, a certain group of, of religious um, Jews were, were using this law to their advantage to take advantage of women. And so Jesus is saying, basically, you need to cut it out. Don't take advantage of, of women. You need to, to say what you're going to do, and you need to care for these women who have, I've, I've entrusted to you. Which brings us to this week which is about oaths. So again, we're in Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 through 37. So if you would, follow along with me on the screens or in your Bibles. It says this, again, you have heard it said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is of the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say simply be yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. This is the word of the Lord in our hearing this morning. 
Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for Jesus, for his perfect life, for his death and his resurrection. Father, and we thank you specifically this morning for the Sermon on the Mount. Father, as it impacted those in, that heard it in person and how it impacts us today, Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit would work mightily this morning, whether people are here uh, hearing me in person or whether they're at home or whether they're listening to this on YouTube later this week. Father, I pray that you would just do a mighty word uh, in what they're experiencing today. Father, I pray that, that we would hear about the importance of our integrity and how you are calling us to do what we say we're going to do. So I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So here what we have to say is that keeping our oaths, keeping our word is a good message. But why is Jesus bringing that in the middle of the Sermon of the Mount? I mean, we were just talking about lust. We were talking about murder. talking about divorce. And now here we are taking, uh, talking about oaths. So what is happening in the Jewish culture? Why is Jesus bringing, the, bringing this up? And, shocker, there is a problem in how people are abusing their word and abusing oaths to take advantage of other people. I know that never happens today. It definitely didn't happen back in Jesus' time. Sarcasm. But here we are, and this is what we see happening. This is from D.A. Carson. D.A. Carson says, in the Jewish uh, law called Mish Mishnah, there was one uh, whole treatise given over to the question. So the Mishnah is a, is a way that rabbis, it would, it would be a chapter, well, oh, chapter today. It would be Reddit today. Sorry, chapter is AOL days, Reddit's today, you know. Uh, but it's a way that ra Jewish rabbis would discuss important questions of the day. And one of the uh, conversations they had was on oath keeping. Like there needs to be a question on how to keep oath. Do you keep an oath? Yes, you do what you're going to say you're going to do, right? That seems pretty simple to me, but apparently it wasn't. And here, as uh, those lawyers, right, Rob, uh, we talked about before, uh, anytime lawyers are involved, you have to, uh, they want to get to the minutiae. They need to see what, you know, how they can take things to their advantage, right? And that's what's happening with these Jewish leaders is they are trying to find how they can take advantage and how they can put things towards their uh, advantage. And, and what this uh, conversation looked like is these are the instructions that they had. One rabbi said that if you swear by Jerusalem, then you're not bound by your vows. But if you swear toward Jerusalem, then you're bound by your vows. So you have to go back. What did they say exactly? Amber always says, whenever I'm, especially whenever babies are born, she asks for certain details. She'll say, well, what did they say? How, how much was the baby? How long was the baby? I'm like, I don't know. I can't remember that. Well, what did they exactly say? That's what's happening here. They're saying, if you say, swear by Jerusalem, you're good. You don't have to keep it. But if they say the word toward Jerusalem, then you're bound by your vows. The swearing of oath, oaths does, uh, degenerates into terrible rules, which lets you know when you can get away with lying and deception and when you can't. These oaths are no longer for, uh, foster truthfulness, but weaken the cause of truth and promote decay, swearing evasively becomes a justification for lying. And Jesus is not going to allow such glibness of truth among his followers. If men will play such games with oaths, Jesus is simply going to abolish oaths. He is interested in truthfulness and its consistency and absoluteness. Amen. And so here, again, what Jesus is trying to do, how do we have human flourishing? How do we have justice? Is when people do what they say they're going to do. So here, this passage, it's about oaths, right? He's talking specifically about oaths. If you have any friends that are Quakers, we don't have as many Quakers as there used to be, it seems like. Um, but Quakers, this is why they don't take oaths. They go into a courtroom, and they say, raise your right hand. They're like, I can't do it. The Bible says, I can't take oaths, right? And so here, I'm not going to focus as much on, on not taking oaths, because oaths are a symptom of the bigger problem, right? Jesus is addressing how the Jewish people are trying to get out of being held accountable by how they're trying to sneak certain words in, right? And so Jesus is saying, fine. If this is the way you're going to behave, I'll just take all oaths away, right? He's like, Dad, kids are fighting in the back seat. He's like, fine. I'm going to turn this car around. We're just not going to have oaths anymore. And that's why Jesus is addressing the way he is. Because again, he's speaking 
speaking of hyperbole. He's saying this is a, a, uh, a problem in society. And so ultimately what Jesus is talking about here is our integrity. Do we have integrity? Does our society have integrity? Does our church have integrity? Those are questions that we should ask. Because again, Jesus is trying to recalibrate his people that are coming into the kingdom to make sure their hearts are ready for the kingdom. And he's saying to be in the kingdom, you need to have integrity. If you're going to be part of this family, you need to do what you say you're going to do. So we see this in three specific ways on how this impacts us. One, we need to seek integrity. One, because God says so. Two, because we need to have others be able to trust us and believe us. And also, by whatever we, however we have our integrity, it shows what we value. So first, what we see in this one, uh, we've talked about, uh, I'm sure, before, but we, God calls us to integrity. It's one of the top ten, those big ten commandments that we see in the Exodus, right? He says, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You need to talk, tell the truth about your neighbor, tell the truth about what you've seen, and give good testimony. Also, one of the ways that we see uh, integrity is in Proverbs 11, uh, 1, where God, uh, here Solomon says that false weights, improper weights, are an abomination to God. And what is happening here? Well, the way that they would, in the marketplace, whenever you go to the cash register and they bring you up, you know those little scales that you put the produce on, right, at the supermarket now? It was kind of like the same way, except they weren't electronic. And our kids, they've never seen uh, doors that don't open whenever you go into the supermarket, right? It's kind of weird. Back in the day, not only did they not have those doors that open in the supermarket, they also didn't have scales that you put things on, so they'd have these, you know, like justice-type scales, right? The old-fashioned scales. And what would happen is that the, the people selling items that would bring the scales would bring false weights in so that they would have an advantage to make sure that they made more money off that. I know all money, I know all businesses, you know, behave above board. We don't have that problem anymore. But back in the day, there was. And those false scales were an abomination to the Lord. So what we see throughout Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, is that God calls us to have integrity, to do what we say we're going to do, and, and that's what God calls us to. Second, we see uh, we need to have others... We need to have integrity so others will believe us. So when people see us, they know, oh, it's Jacob. I know he's going to do what he says he's going to do. Now, one of my one of my favorite stories where it talks about this is the line of which the wardrobe. So C.S. Lewis, I you know I bring him back. Marvel movies, comic book movies, C.S. Lewis, all really good to bring back, right? But here, this one specifically is the line of which the wardrobe. And what we see in the story is that whenever Lucy and Edmund first go to Narnia, whenever they go to the wardrobe, and Lucy has a good time going to this winter wonderland, right? And she meets Mr. Tumnus, the fawn, which was a half-goat, half-man, and has tea time with them. She comes back, and she's super excited. She comes back out of the, uh, the wardrobe, and Peter and Susan are there because they're trying to play hide-and-seek, right? She bumps into them, and she tells them this, fan, uh, this fantastic story about how she left, and she went through the wardrobe, that she went to a magical land, that she met this half-goat, half-man half thing, and they had tea time, and she was there all day, and she was apologizing because she, she fell asleep, and she'd been gone all day. And they said, excuse me, we're still playing hide-and-seek. You've only been gone a short amount of time. And then Edmund's right behind her, and, and they look at him and, and he just says, we were just playing pretend. This didn't really happen. So now Susan and Peter have a problem. Are they going to believe uh, Lucy? Are they going to believe Edmund? Who's telling the truth? Is their sister losing her mind, thinking she went to some crazy place? What's happening? So what we see in the story is they go to the professor that they're staying with because they feel that they are getting out of their league and they're fearing that Lucy is losing her mind and Peter and Susan decide to seek advice from the professor and when they speak to him, they're surprised to find that he appears to believe Lucy's story. He points out that they have never known her to lie, that she is a person of integrity, that she always does what she says she's going to do. Whereas Edmund, on the other hand, he, he is a little jerk. He has a history of lying, and the professor says that the rest of Lucy's behavior proves that she's not insane. He can 
contends that Susan and Peter's view of the uh, possible and impossible are narrow if they reject the possibility of another world such as Narnia. Furthermore, the professor also concocts an ingenious theory to explain how Lucy was only gone for a second. He explains that, that a separate world would more likely have a separate time and would not be would correspond to our sense of time. Peter and Susan leave the professor's room more confused when they went in, but just enough doubt to become weary of the whole subject. They remain quiet on the issue and make sure Edmund leaves Lucy alone. So here what the professor is really trying to say is who's the more truthful person? Lucy! Who should you believe? Lucy! And so this for Christians should be a, a reminder for us is that if we are honest, if we have integrity, whenever we tell people that our Savior died and rose from the dead, and they say, I haven't seen anyone else raised from the dead, you must be crazy. We could say, is he crazy about anything else? Is he honest about everything else? So he must be honest or she must be honest about this. We should be honest because of this. But the problem is, is that those that are without the church, that are outside of the church, don't have the best impression of those inside the church. One of the studies I looked up this week, a survey of three, a little over 3,000 Americans, so it's not a big sample size, so those statisticians, I know I'm, I'm recognizing a small sample size, but still. Aged over 18, carried out by Ipsos for the Episcopal Church in the United States. Half of those uh, that responded to this survey described themselves as non-religious, considered American Christians to be self-righteous, 55% hypocritical, and 54% judgmental. Those are not in the church, those maybe grew up around the church, but they consider themselves non-religious. So they are looking within the church, and they're seeing that there is a problem. That Christians don't always do what they say they're going to do, and they're hypocrites. So they say one thing, don't do this, as we wave our fingers, but then they also say, don't do as I say, do as I, or don't do as I, or do as I say, don't do as I do, on the other side. And so here, again, a problem with integrity. We also see this not only in the church, but also with pastors. In an anonymous survey, 33% of pastors admitted to cross the line with a woman, not their spouse, while having been caught. In another study, the respondents revealed that one in nine pastors, around 11%, had committed adultery. And similar findings were discovered in a survey of 277 Southern Baptist pastors. 14% were involved in some inappropriate sexual activity. 10% disclosed they had a sexual relationship with either a present or former church member. So if there's going to be a rotten apple at the top, what's going to happen to the congregation? If the person at the top doesn't care about integrity, then what's going to happen to those that are in the flock? And this, talking about sexual morality, that's, that's a pretty big one. But it's also not in the big things. It's also in the small things. Being a pastor for, for going on two decades now, Sorry, why I have so many gray hairs, not my hopes I've been taking. But it's always interesting whenever you go to a pastor's conference, there's a lot of plaid usually, to be honest, and especially recently there have been more and more beers at these conferences. But it's also interesting to hear how pastors talk. And I'm sure that whatever business you're in, you're, you're familiar with this, when you talk shop and you like to compare notes, right? There's always certain things that you like to brag about or talk about to make yourself look better. But inevitably, every time in these pastor conferences, what we will see is pastors will say, so how many people attend your church? And it's a way to say, oh, it, my church is so healthy, we have people coming out uh, the wazoo. And they always fudge the numbers to always have more people. So they always have their Sunday attendance, uh, they also have the regular attendance, and I almost guarantee every conversation I would hear at these pastor conferences, it would always be higher, and I would look at these guys and be like, really? Why? Because they wanted themselves to be seen as more successful than they really were. And they'd always talk about the different ministries they have going on and different things they were involved in, but the problem is, is that they were fudging the little things. And if you're going to fudge the little things, where does that line go? When do you start fudging the big things, right? So you 
you start not making budget, then what do you do? What numbers do you fudge? How do you make it look like you are? And so the important thing is that what we need to see, why it's important for me, why it's important for Jacob Grant, for staff, to have integrity and why I look for character more than competence is because it's important on how it helps us all to be held accountable and to have integrity. And finally, it shows what we value. The question is, do we value Christ and the kingdom or do we value what of this world and what this world deems as important? For those pastors who like to budge the numbers on how many people attend their church, who is drawing the people that's in their church to their church? God, right? I've known pastors that are super smart, super talented. Uh, a couple years ago, whenever I was uh, planting King's Cross, what we saw was uh, part of our fellowship of other church planters. This is, there was a guy that we knew was going to do tremendous things. Like, you know, there's the cream of the crop. There's the football star that you know, like, he's going to go on to do major things. There's the business guy that's like, he's going to have a bajillion dollars. A bajillion is a real number, by the way. This was a guy that we knew was going to do not only have a ginormous church, but also really hit people in their hearts and just be a great pastor and leader. And then COVID hit. And in the aftermath, his church was one of the first churches that had to, to close. Because they were drunk people, they weren't able to, to, to get the funding, so they had, they had to shift. And so here, what we say about that is that he had talent. He could have done, he could have bunched numbers. He could have gotten people there in, in, in uh, illegitimate ways or tried to bring people in, but he didn't. He stayed with integrity. Um, and even with his talent, God shows that this was his story. And so is he okay with that? And that's what we have to ask. And so here, we need to be thankful for what God is giving us and what we have. And we shouldn't manipulate or cheat or steal as a way to, to supplement what we have. Because if we're budging numbers, if we're saying things and we accomplish things that we don't really do to make ourselves look good, then what do I care about? I care about the fear of man and caring about what other people see, what other people believe about me, rather than what is true. So one of the things we always talk about is what does your Facebook page look like? What does your social media look like? If you look at a lot of people's social media pages, everything is perfect all of the time. It's like you're living in Martha Stewart's house all the time. But the reality is, is that the truth? No. We are going through trauma all the time. Whether it's ourselves having hospital stays that are longer than we expect, whether it's uh, friends or family that are having house fires or going through natural disasters. This week I saw flooding in Brooklyn, which I was like, what in the world is happening here? Tragedy is happening all the time, and you usually don't post those in your Facebook feed. And so we need to ask the questions, do I have integrity? Do I do what I say I'm going to do? couple of ways that I've seen this play out, and these are older, so some of you probably weren't alive yet, you youngins, but one was the Enron scandal back in 2001. So here, they cook the books, their, their, their uh, profits, their shares uh, went down dramatically because they, they didn't want uh, the public to know, and as a consequence of the scandal, there became new uh, regulations and legislations were enacted to expand the accuracy of financial reporting for public companies. One piece of legislation increased penalties for destroying, alter, uh, altering, or fabricating records in federal investigations uh, to attempting to defraud shareholders. I know that doesn't happen anymore, that's just 2001. Everybody has better hearts now. We just do things the way we're supposed to. But here, what did they care about? They cared about their profit. They cared about their bottom line. Especially those CEOs and those uh, executives, they wanted those bonuses, right? So the question we have to have, ask if we're in business, do I do that? Do I inflate my numbers? Why? 
Another big one that was seen in front of the world was back in 1998 when we heard former President Bill Clinton say in a deposition, well, it depends on what your definition of is is. I don't know if you remember that, I do. But here, did he know what the defini definition of is is? Yes. Was he, from a legal perspective, trying to protect himself? Absolutely. And again, I know that no politicians do anything like this today. No, actually, in fact, I think people, I don't know, this is me being cynical. Every, every politician does this. But we don't call it fabrication, right? We don't call this lying anymore. What do we call it? Spin. That's why we have spin rooms after every debate. Well, this is what really happened. But the problem is, and I think Ralph said this this week at Bible study, the problem with politics, the problem with government, is we get the government we deserve. And so we need to hold ourselves accountable, we need to hold our politicians accountable, and we need to be informed. We have become very segmented and very tribal as a society. We only accept information from our tribes and our news sources. And because of that, we have become an echo chamber. So the reality is, is if I came in and I quoted from MSNBC, I'm going to start getting side eyes from some of you. Because, oh, that's a liberal news source. You can't listen and you can't trust them. And in the same way, if I started quoting from Fox News, what's going to happen? I'm going to get the other eyes. The other side eyes look at me and say, you can't listen to Fox News. And that's because more and more we're not concerned about the information that is going out in the airwaves. We're just concerned about the money that those institutions are making and how they can keep viewers turning in. And I've talked about this before, how these news sources are really utilizing these narratives to separate us and not giving out the best information. So we need to be informed. We need to, to, to check the information that we have, and is it truthful and whole, and ask good questions. We need to have integrity, and we need to operate in a way that is having, that our word is our bond, that people can trust us, not budging numbers for our own benefit, or our own agendas, where we're trying to inform people. We need to understand that the ends don't justify the means, which is difficult. And I know what you're saying, and don't worry, you're going to say it more next week whenever I talk about retribution and turning the other cheek. You're going to say, Pastor, this isn't the way the world works. We need to play by their rules. We need to play by their games. If they're going to lie, I need to lie. If we're going to win, we need to do it the way the world does. And that's not what Jesus is saying. He's saying, that's not how it works in my kingdom. This isn't about how you're taking an oath by Jerusalem or towards Jerusalem. You have integrity. You hold people accountable. So what, how do we do this? You can't change the world. You can't save the world, but you can save one. You can start with yourself and work from there. How do we do this? We start having integrity and being trust, trustful. Sometimes what we need to do with some people around us is whenever you're not sure, you need to fill the gap with trust until they, they, they show, like Edmund, they can't be trusted. So fill the gap with trust and trust those around you. But we also need to be able to ask good questions uh, about information that we're receiving. And we need to be able to receive questions and give, ask questions. So it needs to be give and take. And sometimes we need to be able to push back and say, I don't know if that's accurate information. I don't know if that's true. I don't know if that's uh, uh, the way it works. And we have to say, okay, uh, let me give me more information. Help me to understand that better. And for those introverts in the room, those that like to would rather be at home by themselves reading a book and being away from everyone else, um, those uh, that are introverts, they don't always process in, a, in real time. It's hard for them to, to, to think of questions during that conversation. So there has to be room for follow-up, where they get the questions afterwards on the way home, later on that evening, and say, hey, I need to talk to you, and I had a question for what we talked about the other day. So we need to be able to have people and be trustful and to have uh, uh, accurate information. The other thing we have to do is we have to ask ourselves the following questions. Are we
are we honest with God? When I'm praying, am I really telling God what's on my heart, what's on my mind, or am I even trying to deceive God? That God isn't here, that God doesn't know. Sometimes we do that. Second, we need to be honest with others. That's what we've been talking about all morning. Do we have integrity? Are we going to do what we're going to say we're doing? And if we can't, like I'm not saying you have to be perfect, but if you can't accomplish what you said you're going to do, have a conversation saying, hey, I know the, the goal was to have this done here. I can't hit that due date. I need to have some more time or I need some help. And that's okay. That's having integrity. That's being honest. And the other thing is that we need to be honest with ourselves. What do we honor? What do we value? What do we cherish? Do we, would we rather God and, and the kingdom or would we rather have my boss think well of me or my father-in-law think well of me? or whatever it may be. What do we value? Are we honest with ourselves? Thomas Martin says this, this is what I'll end with. In the end, the problem of sincerity is a problem of love. A sincere person is not so much one who sees the truth and manifests it as he sees it, the one who loves the truth with a pure love. But the truth is more than an abstraction. It lives and is embodied in people and things that are real. And the secret of sincerity is, therefore, not to be sought in a philosophical love for an abstract truth, but in a love for real people and real things. A love for God, apprehended in reality around us, it is difficult to express in words how important this notion is. The whole problem of our times is not a lack of knowledge, because we have more information at our fingertips than ever before, but it's a lack of love. If we only love one another, we would have no difficulty in trusting one another and sharing the truth with one another. So this week, my encouragement is to look at your heart. Are you being truthful or are you not? If you're not being truthful, or even look at this past week, what were things you kind of we're totally honest about. What were those things? Why? And let's do those part, that time of God and say, God, I'm sorry. And how can I love you more and, and trust and love others better? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your love for us. Father, how you pursue us, how you care for us. Father, I pray that you would help us to be honest and truthful. Father, sometimes it's difficult. Father, there's a lot of times that we feel insecure, rather than we're not good enough. And so to compensate, we tend to fudge numbers that we try to tell people they don't want to hear just to make ourselves look better. And sometimes at the, at the expense of uh, other coworkers or friends or neighbors or loved ones. So Father, I pray that you would help us to decipher when we've done that, how we've, um, how we've hurt your name, how we have hurt our witness, Father, and how we've hurt others. So, Father, I pray that you would help us uh, to examine our hearts and our minds and how we can be people of integrity, that people know that we're going to say what we're going to do, and that people, uh, if we have, if it's being an option, people would say, I trust, I trust uh, these Redeemer folks to do the right thing, because they always say what they're going to do, and they do it. Father, I just thank you for Jesus and his Sermon on the Mount, and how it calls us to help with human flourishing and injustice. And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's also Communion Sunday. And so we are going to take time this morning to be able to have our family meal together. And so we do this every month as a way and an expression to remind ourselves, to remind each other of our need for Jesus. That we do not come, come to church, we do not operate out of religiosity, out of legalism, saying that if we come to church enough, if we give enough money to the church, if we do all the things during the week for Jesus, that that's going to earn our way to heaven. Because we can't earn our way to heaven. And so we come each month and we take communion as a way to remind ourselves to be nourished by Jesus, that it's his work that saves us. His work that needs to be done. So each month when we take communion, we begin by taking, uh, giving a corporate confession of sin.
And then we take time and process, as, as our ushers will come up in just a minute, as we will process our sin, how we've lied, how we've cheated, how we've stolen, how we've taken advantage, how we've lusted, how we've had anger against others. We can uh, give a corporate confession of our sin, and we process that, and we, we do our business with God as we confess personally. But then we have an assurance of heart and understanding that Jesus has paid it all. And it's not our work, but Jesus has done the work that saves us. And then we have the, the words of institution, and then we take communion together. So I'm going to invite our ushers to come forward. And I'm going to encourage us to read this corporate confession of sin that will be on the screens. So if you would... Please read along on the screens with me. Almighty God, we acknowledge and confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. Deepen within us our sorrow for the wrong we have done, the good we have left undone, Lord, you are full of compassion and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. There is always forgiveness with you. Restore to us the joy of your salvation. Bind up that which is broken. Give light to our minds, strength to our wills, and rest to our souls. Speak to each of us and let your word abide with us until it is wrought in us your holy will. So as we pass the elements out, please take a moment and consider what Jesus has done for you.
ask all those who are to stand and please stand. I know it's dangerous to start off or in, I should say, with a acapella kind of chorus. It's been a while since we've done this, but we'll do it two times through. If you need to listen, go free. But we're just going to sing the chorus in the name of the Lord. Power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in. 